almost we're live. Yeah. Oh. Hi, I'm Deborah Lucci from the Deborah Lucci team. We're a real estate team of 10 people in Andover, Massachusetts. And we have today um, team members Mackenzie Cormier, Nicole Leahy, and Angela Sweeney. And we have two guests with us. We have Jack O'Donohue from Touchstone. He is a lawyer in our area, covers the Cape, Boston, and the Andover area. And we also have Ryan Leahy from Mortgage Network. He was on our show before, and we've invited them back again. And the subject today is going to be forbearance and how um, the market is going to be affected. So um, I was in Florida last weekend, and I was having a cocktail. And I was having a chat with this woman, and she said to me she was waiting because this the forbearance and foreclosures are going to affect this market, and the prices are going to go down, and it's going to be like the real estate market of uh, many years ago. So I proceeded to talk with her a little bit about what I thought was going to happen regarding the forbearance and the foreclosures. So Ryan, you've done you you do a lot of mortgages. Um, and you've done a lot of refis. So when you look at, um, in general, what people owe on their houses in comparison to maybe several years ago, like maybe like 205 in that vicinity, you know, what are you see seeing with people's equity and things like that? Equity is at an all time high right now. Uh, okay. People have incredible equity positions in their home based upon the appreciation that they've seen over the past number of years with their house. So we see people have incredible equity positions. So, you know, I'm forecasting that, you know, we don't see a foreclosure crisis like we did in the 2000s. People aren't going to just go to Bank of America, go to Chase and hand over their keys because they owe more on the mortgage than what the house is worth. These people may be forced to sell if they can't afford their house, which will help inventory and, and you folks will get some listings out of it. But I don't think we're gonna see the foreclosure crisis just because people aren't willing to, to lose out on that equity that they currently have in the house, so. I, you know, I don't know if we have learned from the past. Um, I know, for example, in 205, you know, I was putting my kids through college by myself. So I was using home equity loans to help get them through that. And I think a lot of people were doing that. And, you know, now I think we have a little bit of fear of, of getting to that point again. Um, and, and that's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing like there's almost like 41 percent of people almost have no mortgages on their house at all. So yeah. it's the other extreme. So. Also, keep in mind the landscape of lending back then, right? Uh, you probably remember loans that were called no document loans yep. or, or no income, no asset loans. There was a lot of different names to them. We even had loans that were, uh, that were called negative amortization loans where you paid less than the interest owed on the loan. So people were taking out loans and getting into loans that they probably shouldn't have got into. They were gonna get in trouble eventually. Well, all that cleaned up after you know the mortgage crisis happened, and now loans are <clears throat> loans are good loans now, where people are vetted and, and made sure that they're going to be able to afford these loans for the long term. So, uh, Mackenzie, Nicole, and Angela, when you're out there with buyers right now, what do you what are you hearing them think about what's going to happen with the market? Well, I'm trying to. Uh keep my buyers level-headed and calm and understand that the uh, market value is what buyers are willing to pay, fair market value. And I think that, um, you know, markets, I, I know that real estate is always a good investment. If you're going to be in a property long enough, um, it's certainly going to hold its value or come back around. Um, they, they, you know, they're a little skittish about how competitive things are at the moment. But, um, you know, they certainly, if you if you qualified for a loan, um, and that's the price point you end up having to pay, uh, just as long as you know you have a good lender like Ryan, and um, you know you you stay within your means, the the, the value comes back and. Um, or, or remains. And I 
wholeheartedly agree with Ryan. This is not going to be another case of what we saw, um, you know, in, in 05, 06, 07. Yeah. So if people are sitting on the sidelines waiting for this big crash, they might be very disappointed. Yep. So, I, I, yeah, that's you know, what they're you, saying. We, right. Go ahead, they're Nicole. all waiting for them. Um, oh, sorry, Deb. But I was just going to say they're all waiting for you know i have people that are like you know what i'm going to sit out for a little bit i'm going to wait for the values you know to drop a little bit everything's through the roof i'm not you know i don't want to get into a bidding war i don't want to overpay but then you know i i make sure that they understand that you know if once values drop mortgage rates could go up and then they're paying the same amount of money that they would have been paying right now anyway and if they're going to stay there like you said if they're going to stay there for the long haul then why do they even care? Pay, you know, if you can afford the monthly mortgage payment and you kind of stick to your guns on that, maybe you don't look at the price tag or what you're overbidding as long as it's something that you can afford. Because the, you know, over time, if you're going to stay there ten plus years, it's going to be the the value of the house could could increase by then if you went to go sell it. So I don't think everybody should be so ready to just sit on the sidelines and be like, I'm going to wait for values to drop because then you might not be able to afford the house that you can get now. So. So Ryan, what are you seeing rates do? <laughs> oh, we can't hear. Oh wait, Ryan. No. Yeah. You're muted. Sorry about that, guys. I wanted to make sure I didn't interrupt any of you. Um, so unfortunately, rates have been going up as of recently. Uh, we saw probably an eighth or a quarter percent move in interest rates last week. What you have going on is there's all this anticipation with um, the stimulus package that everybody's heard about, the $1.9 trillion mm -hmm. stimulus package. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you're dumping that much money into the economy, you're going to likely be dealing with inflation. And inflation is the enemy of mortgage interest rates. So I assure you rates are going to be good in 2021, but we're probably past the days of two and a half in 2.625 on 30 year fixed rates like we saw at the bottom of this during the pandemic. So um, so they, they are going up. I imagine we'll see rates for most of the year in the 2.875 to maybe three and a half percent range. And uh, that's still incredible. Um, the average rate of interest over the past 50 years is 7.75 and people forget that because rates have been so good for so long, so. right. So, Jack, what are you seeing? You're doing a lot of closings out there. I mean, are you seeing, you know, um, the forbearance or anything like that affecting what you are doing right now? You know, it's interesting to think about it. Um, and it's really kind of forward thinking of you, Debbie, to even introduce it, the idea that forbearance could have an impact on the market. Um, what, what I've seen it most notably impact is people refinancing um, because, they have to sign these attestations that they're not in forbearance when they're refinancing. That was a Fannie guideline initially. Um, interestingly, like digging in a little bit more, I thought you guys would find this uh, interesting in the audience perhaps too. 38% um, of men, or men, men were far more over, over, overwhelmingly likely to apply for forbearance. 38% <laughs> of men and only 10% for women. So I found that really interesting. Um, <laughs> You know, and the other thing is what we're, and this was also, this is uh, the forbearance, because it's two things, right? This forbearance and foreclosure. The forbearance piece of it is interesting because it's mostly been higher income, you know, higher net worth geographic areas, which is, you know, thankfully where we are. So, you know, that's interesting because if those folks, if, and, and also early on, at least a lot of the data that I looked at was from early on. You know, about 70% of the people that got the forbearance, they didn't really need it. They just, they just, it was available to them. So they just took it, you know? So you give me three months off, great, I'll take it. You know, or you're kicking the can 30 years down the road, I'll take it. So, you know, that's interesting. And what what, what we're really need to be in tune with uh, to Ryan's point and everybody's point is like, are there people that are really negatively impacted by this crisis long-term and they're just sort of holding on, holding on, holding on, living for free? Um, you know, are those people, is, is that inventory going to flood the market? You know, I, I don't think that's going to happen personally. Um, and I think if the areas that it does happen, it's going to be in lower income areas, uh, based on the, the data that's available. Um, I've never been more bullish on the real estate sector in my whole career. Um, I can, you know, 
pretty firmly say right now, like pe people who are listening or watching and maybe they sat out the last year, they're kicking themselves, right? I mean, prices have gone up, you know, multiples, many multiples, and you've got everybody kind of like scratching their head. And listen, there's none of the infrastructure is in place for, for, for a recession. Like I, I'll predict that matter of fact, like we are not going to decline. We, we may slow the rate of increase on pricing, but you know, again, there's that corollary between interest rates, but I think ultimately the prices are going to continue to increase, perhaps not at this rate, but it's like a bump and then it's going to keep going up. That's my, that's what I think. And all the data I think supports that, that I've seen. All right, so explain to me a little bit about this forbearance um, because I'm I am paying my mortgage. Yeah, I want to pay, I want to pay it off. That's my goal. Yeah. So, um, so well, the the big thing, the Biden administration extended it till the end of June of this year. So, right, so and that's when did it start, Jack? I think it started right at the beginning of the right at the beginning of the uh, pandemic back in March of 2020. Oh. They kind of quickly rolled out this action to. To have the ability for people to, um, you know, to for to forbearance just means they're you you get to skip payments. They're taking it the payments that were due now and they're moving them to the end of the of the loan period. Um, it's really that simple for people who might not be that familiar with it. Um, and then they just kept threatening to like reinstate or reinstate these rules on it, but it just continued on and continued to be extended. And you reach these kind of deadlines and then they're extended again. So now we're extended again. We're extended till June of 2021, where um, you know there's there's no foreclosures allowed. There's no uh, that's a big piece of it too. That's the second piece of this thing is you know if the, your friend that you were talking to, if they think that that there's going to be a big foreclosure push, you know there probably will be because there are homes that have been you know rent free for a year and a half. But you know how much of the market is it is the question. Now um, you. Th all right. So basically, what's what, what happens with forbearance is these people don't have to pay double payments; it just extends it out. Exactly. So, so yeah. it, you know, it, it doesn't seem that that they would have a problem with that, really. And and it's not always extended out, by the way. So what happens is it's just a pause to your payments. Okay. Yeah. The forbearance period is just a pause. At the end of that pause, when the forbearance ends then it's up to the lender and the borrower to figure out the terms from there. The whole, the, the payments missed could be all due at that time. They may have to come up with a large sum of money. Many times they modify the loan to add smaller payments to the individual mortgage payments going forward. So there's no set plan once you come out of forbearance as to how you're going to have to repay that money. That gets worked out after the forbearance, between the lender and the client, so. So, but you cannot, you you would miss out on refinancing your home if there was a great rate because you can't because of the, you're in forbearance, correct? That, that brings up a good point and Jack spoke to this. There was so many folks, you know, under the CARES Act, you could go into forbearance without actually showing any hardship. So you didn't have to lose a job with the pandemic, nothing had to happen. You just had to request the pause. So there's plenty of people in forbearance that are actually still making their mortgage payments as they go along. They just wanted that as their safety net in case something were to happen. So right now, conventional mortgages, which are the most common ones, if you're in forbearance and you're made whole on the back due amount, by the time you close on a new mortgage loan, you're fine, you can refinance. If you're past the forbearance period and you're in some sort of modification, you have to make three on-time modification payments before being eligible for a refinance. Now, what's interesting, because we're obviously right on the purchase side with this, with this um, Facebook Live, on a purchase, let's, I've had clients that are in forbearance, sold their home right away, and we're able to buy another home right after the fact. And the reason being is because they're making whole with the payoff of that mortgage that's being paid, being paid off within the sale. They're, they're paying off the past due balance. So they, they're fine to qualify for a new mortgage loan without waiting. Now, Jack, you were talking a little bit about foreclosures. You know, what do you know about these? What type of properties do you see? With, what do you think is going to happen with the foreclosures? it's it's a you know it's 
likely that there will be an influx, right? Because they haven't been able to, to have any sales. So those are all sort of in the queue, I'm sure, ready to actually happen. Um, it's just a matter of when. So that will happen. The question is, you know, it, we already know what it is. The data is out there. The percentages are out there of people. I think it's like 10 million homes that are in forbearance. But if you figure that 70% of those people don't really need it to the people that we're talking about, then you're talking about 3 million homes across the country um, that are that are in serious struggle. You know, and whereas before, I don't know what the numbers were back then, but that was sort of an institutional problem. That was an institutional problem of people getting money that they shouldn't have. And to Ryan's earlier point too, it's like people, it's really tough to qualify right now. So um, it, you're not seeing that the use case that that, that existed back then. Um, I, I just so that, don't think it's, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, that may help us with some inventory. Yeah, it, it could, it absolutely could potentially. But, you know, and the other, the other advantage though, is that they may be, you know, maybe they were able to refinance because the values have gone up so much. Mm -hmm. So, or, or sell and make money ahead of the foreclosure. There'll be, there is gonna be some opportunity there. I think that's that's very reasonable. But the expectation that it's going to cause this dramatic decline in pricing is, is, is I, don't, I don't buy that at all, personally. So I have another question here. Since we're, we're tight on inventory, and I've been kind of dying to get you guys on because I, I wanna, <laughs> this, this is fairly new. I, I mean, I haven't seen this in the 24 years I've been doing this so much, but, so it seems like the buyers and sellers are getting more creative in order to close the deal. So we're seeing more uh, use and occupancy, uh, things like this, okay? Uh, that, you know, the seller has a little bit more leverage than they used to have in, in past markets. So the buyers are willing to give like the uh, sellers a use and occupancy where they can stay in your home, their home. So tell me about like, you know, what are some of, you know, length of time that they can do some of the problems that they've had, you know, when we write up offers, like what should be in these offers? I mean, how, you know, we're not lawyers. So when we write up offers, so what, what are some of the things that we should write in there? Well, I know just from talking to people like Ryan, I mean, it's gotta be, if it's a use and occupancy, it's gotta be less than 60 days. I believe that's the guideline. I that wish is, that's yeah. one of, that's one of those things I wish I didn't know, but I do. Um, you know, so if you're going to do a use and occupancy period, that's totally fine, but it's just got to be within 60 days, but it is a great tool to have if you're a seller. And it's important to realize that, look, you, you can sell your place, cash out, and then still live there for two months while you're waiting to close on something or renting or, you know, just, and a lot of times it can be, sometimes it's rent free. Sometimes it's a market per diem for the, for the place like this for a seller out there, there's so much flexibility you can have. You've got You've got so much leverage right now, to your point. Um, you could dictate terms 100%. All right. So when the girls are writing up, when the team members are writing up an offer, okay, how much detail should they get into? Should they leave the monthly uh, fee out of it? Should they uh, Should they put it in there? Um, we One of my team members, Diana, um, who's not on this call today, her lender, the, the lender that that buyer had was only good for 30 days. Okay. And it was almost like it was almost like this was the first time he had heard it where, you know, I spoke with Ryan and you before I, I got more black and white answers. So you, you, it sounds like you've dealt with a lot more. But, you know, I, I mean, is it is there like a standard use and occupancy form that we can attach to an offer? Absolutely. I mean, I think but I, if it were me and I were in your shoes, I would just want to I would define the amount because. Otherwise, it's ambiguous. And also, maybe you don't necessarily need to say whether there's going to be a security deposit or not, because we get into that with a purchase and sale. But but I think in, as far as the amount, I think it's totally reasonable to say, hey, we're not going to charge you or we'd like you to pay our carrying costs. You know, whatever is reasonable based on the negotiation. I personally feel like right now sellers have so much leverage. If I was selling right now, I'd say I'm living there for 60 days rent free take it or leave it, you know, um, yeah. that's the, that's the leverage sellers have right now. And, you know, it's funny because we're doing one of these deals right now. And, and one of my admin came up to me because the seller has to pay the utilities and, you know, we're used to taking water readings at a, yeah. you know, on the closing and, 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 you know, what do we do with the gas here and all these other things. And I guess all the utilities, including the water are going to get red when the seller leaves. They're not even going to be read for the closing. So 
th th this was a little bit of questions I had. So, um, Ryan, how does the bank feel about this? Well, you know, Jack mentioned conventional loans require that somebody buying a primary residence occupies the property within 60 days. So that's where that 60 day time frame comes is in order for the buyer to qualify for the home as their primary, which is going to give them the best interest rate, so on and so forth, they have to be able to occupy within 60 days. So if you have a use and occupancy for 90 days, right, we cannot do that loan for them anymore as a primary residence. We could have them buy it as an investment property, let's say, but the rate's going to be significantly higher, which drives up payment and it's a domino effect. So that's why somebody that's going to be living in the property is going to be want to be in there within that 60 day period. So, so Jack, what is the difference between a use and occupancy and a lease? So it's really it's a term of art, but a use and occupancy, you're you're there as you're using the premises. You're a licensee. So you don't have the same rights as a tenant. So you don't have to be a, the eviction process is much faster, essentially. You can skip a whole cumbersome step of eviction. You can essentially walk right into the court and say, these people are at my property. They don't have a right to be there. I want the sheriff there in 48 hours. I want them to pack all their stuff. We can't swear on this, but pack all their stuff and get them out. Um, you know, that's that's the reality of it. It's it's a it's a really critical kind of legal term of art. Um, just that they're not tenants, even though they feel like tenants. They're not tenants, they're licensees. So now I know some of the problems on uh, what I, and we, you know, one of my, one of my girls had a property that she did the use and occupancy for. And uh, what happened is they did the final walkthrough. First of all, you do the final walkthrough at the closing, all this stuff is there. So you really can't, you know, see so much what's going on. And then what happened is um, at the, at when the, when the use and occupancy was up, she went through the property with the new buyers and the home wasn't clean. And what happened is there was, there was no recourse. That was really kind of it. So, uh, you know, what have you seen, you know, and, and I think that, you know, I think what you're saying too, Jack, is we, you, we should leave that kind of stuff up to the lawyers a little bit when it, when it hits the of purchase and sale. So what have you seen, like if you represent a buyer, you know, what type of language do you put in and what type of language do you kind of put in when you represent a seller? It's interesting, you know, when I represent a buyer, I will never, and we're having this conversation, so this is contrary to that, but I will never put in writing or even admit that I said that I would never do something like this personally as a buyer, because <laughs> I would never want to deal with all these things that we're talking about. There's the, 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 the possibilities of issues exponate or ex, you know ex, exponent whatever the right word is there they, yeah. they, the exponent, they go crazy <laughs> right so i would never as a seller it's awesome but when you're when you're representing a buyer it's it's not advisable because you're you're dealing with a former owner who's on the premises and you've just got those issues that you have to deal with and, and you guys were making me think as you were saying it when you deal with these transactions and there's a use of occupancy in place it makes a lot more work for you you got to do too close. Well, the, the buyer comes through and, you know, they, this is one of the things, you know, actually on the seller's statement, we have it very black and white, you know, and if the seller has to fill out, you know, will you fill the nail holes and paint it or will you not? So yeah. when the buyer walks through, they know like what to expect. But this was not our seller. This was our buyer that we brought through and the buyer walked through and said, you know, geez, you know, when they moved out the nail holes from, from you know, from everything. And so um, I've heard from a buyer's point of view, a lot of what's happening is some of the, their attorneys are trying to put like a, a hold back in place just through the, through the, um, the end of the use and occupancy. And yeah, that, you know, that, yeah, that's very common, a security deposit. I think that's all, I, I think that's all has to do with goodwill. You know, if, if, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a friendly deal, you know, for lack of a better expression, I think that kind of sours the relationship a little bit would be my personal opinion on it. If like, hey, you don't trust me to leave this place perfect. I think it also depends on price point, personality, you know, but if you've got like a hairy situation that then I think you get the security deposit. And that is an important piece to outline earlier on, um, you know, hold back security deposit, whatever you want to call it. You know, we're going to we're going to withhold five thousand dollars or whatever the amount is 
until you're out of here. And then we'll give it back to you after we do that, do that walkthrough. So that's my now, personal take on it. Are you seeing more and more of these? Oh yeah. Yeah. What else are you I, I, seeing out there that's a little bit different? Um, is there anything else or is it really just the use and occupancy? Um, that's what I was going to ask know. him too. I wanted to see what is the craziest stuff that he's seen out there so far. Like oh anyone promised like their first born or I'll like. Tell, <laughs> and we had, we just had a closing that this is a great use and occupancy cautionary tale. And I think this is actually will give Chrissy Bernadette a shout out. This was one of her deals, I think, but she had somebody that they sold the property. They refused to leave. They were camping out on the, at the end of the driveway, drinking beer, hanging out, having like grilling. Like they were, they just- Why was I invited? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a cautionary tale though, right? I mean, that kind of crazy stuff can happen. Um, but what am I seeing that that's unusual? Um, you know, I mean, right, the, 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 the news, right? About the, the, how important your home is right now to you. Um, that's not going to go anywhere. You know, people were all forced to come home and they're staying home and, and they're working from home. I'm at home right now. You know, that's, it's become so clear. That's not something that's just going to disappear because, you know, my position on long-term hybrid work environments is going to be that people are going to, everybody I talk to, they want to do both. They want to go in the office a little bit. They want to be home a little bit, you know? Um, so, th so that's going to be the reality of the world that we're in for the next several years. Um, but what am I seeing that's different? I'm seeing people like very comfortable with dramatic change. I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing a lot of cash. Um, yes. a lot of cash. Yes. Don't, I don't know where it's coming from, but it's coming <laughs> yeah. from somewhere. A lot of money out there. Um, and people are, people are acting fast. They're acting aggressively. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of that, a lot of that happening a lot and a lot of, listen, it's, it's very clearly a seller's market right now across all of new england so wherever you are if you're a seller now is that you know now's a great time to sell if, you, if you're going to go somewhere else <laughs> and, and you know it's, it's it's funny because um one of the things i was listening to the other day was talking about the fact that we keep saying there's no inventory on the market there's no inventory on the market and this may lead sellers to think well if there's no inventory nobody wants to sell i'm not going to sell so i mean actually it's really opposite i mean and i'm uh, you know Every 20, 24 years I've been hearing, I'm waiting for the flowers to come out. My house looks best with the flowers. Yeah. I'm telling you, get it on now. I mean, it's unbelievable. So, so Jack, the use and occupancy, that's one thing that a buyer can do to entice a seller, especially like I saw it the other day on my, um, on my listing on Candida. Um, now what happens is my seller can go out and buy a house without a home sale contingency because, you know, they're going to close and they've got no home sale contingency. So it, it motivates that seller to move. It kind of gets rid of that, you know, wh where am I going to go? Then I'm going to have a home sale contingency type thing. So it works out really, really well. So, so there's, is there any, Ryan, anything that, um, that you've seen come up lately as far as like these use and occupancies or other things that have come across that have kind of, are the, are the bank working with these or are they kind of poo-pooing these or? No, they can work with them. I mean, you're just seeing, you're just seeing buyers like Jack mentioned, just get really aggressive. I don't even know if a home inspector is a perspective <laughs> anymore at this point. It, are those people still out there? Yeah. Because, They're you know, hurting for business. Those it's like yeah. the past. <laughs> now I'm starting to see, you know, people get off of the home inspection, wave that, but now they're doing stuff with the appraised value, right? I'll buy the house even if it comes in $100,000 un, uh, under purchase price. So that's like the new wave home inspection is, you know, putting some language in there about the appraisal. And, and you know, people are, people are really concerned right now with rates, right? We talked about where rates are, where they may be going, but you get, you know, you got to think about it this way. Like we've been looking at rates and they've been a 50% off sale right now, right? We only have to go back to 2018 to see mortgage rates at five. And we we're just experiencing them at two and a half and 2.625. So you had this 50% off sale on mortgage rates, right? Even if they go to 3.375, it's still a 40% off sale. It's still a great deal. 
Um, people are worried about those little incremental, you know, increases in mortgage rates when they shouldn't. They'll still be on sale all 2021. Well, you know, we're running out of time here. And I just want to say, Jack, uh, thank you so much, Jack O'Donoghue from Touchstone and Ryan Leahy from Mortgage Network. And don't forget the ladies here on the team, Mackenzie Cormier, Nicole Leahy, and Angela Sweeney. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to help you with them. And um, thank you so much for joining us today. And that was a great subject, okay? And we'll probably be back for some more of that. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you. Stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, All right, everybody have a great day.